Thanks a lot, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity here to uh, um, come out here and, uh, and talk about my research. I don't know how it's with you, but usually already preparing a talk, um, even though I've worked a long time on this, gets me new insights um, because you really have to think about you know, what you want to talk about again. And uh, I'm sure uh, in the conversations um, uh, I will get fresh ideas. Um, in network theory, usually we try to um, avoid redundant ties, and Arizona is pretty redundant. Uh, so I have high hopes. Uh, I also would like to uh, thank uh, Aubrey uh, a lot. Um, so I will talk about um, heading towards a network theory of effectiveness, and uh, already the title um, hopefully rings a bell. Um, this is basically research that heavily builds on research by Bryn Millward and Keith Proven uh, and others in the public management uh, field on uh, on network management and the effectiveness uh, of network. This is a joint research with my former uh, research master student, uh, Steph Seikerbeik. It doesn't get any more Dutch than this name. Um, but um, he has moved on out of academia and is making some good money uh, at a company. But um, this is still sort of a follow up on uh, work I did with him. Um, so um, the type of network um, I'm talking about today is what uh, uh, Proven, Fish, and Sudo in 2007 coined as whole networks. Even though I have to say I'm not entirely happy with that term anymore, uh, but it describes a, a, a type of network, an inter-organizational network that is consciously created uh, and that has goals. Uh, and this, in comparison to other networks we might study that emerge out of um, bilateral um, interactions that are emergent, but where now sort of conscious um, um, creation takes place or where there is no collective goals. Um, uh, and um, the, the difference is that here also, and I will show that in a bit, um, basically the, the coordin coordination mechanisms or the range that are available are quite different, I believe, from networks that are merely emergent and where people do not sort of take notice uh, necessarily of all the other participants that are in the networks. So organizations in this are um, autonomous but interdependent. Um, and that is uh, the reason why I still believe this is a network and not an organization. Yeah, so um, even though some colleagues say, well, this is not a network anymore, um, and there's basically also a continuum, um, I admit. But in general, I still would claim that these are networks. Um, and, um, and the reason is that the organizations in there are autonomous um, and can make their own decisions. So the, the, the crucial fact here is that it's a joint production of network output. Um, so you could say that none of the organizations that participate uh, would be able to produce the network output on their own. Yeah? Just by joining forces, uh, they will be able to do so. Um, and organizations are often connected by not only one tie, but multiplex ties, uh, finances, services, information exchange, and so on. Um, the research um, in, on these whole networks and the management has um, progressed since the mid-1990s. Um, recently, Torini et al. Uh, published a paper in Public Administration, 2009, where they, starting from the framework um, Keith Proven and Bryn Millward developed with their paper on a preliminary theory of network effectiveness, um, where they basically have th um, three groups um, of variables that appear in the literature and uh, are used to explain network effectiveness. And these are um, network structural characteristics like external control, size, formalization, integration, uh, network functioning, uh, they name here buffering, uh, steering network processes, but you could also definitely um, uh, subsume here the governance um, of networks and leadership. Yeah, um, Agronoff and Maguire from Indiana have worked a lot on that. Um, that would be also more on these network functioning characteristics. And then there are contextual characteristics like system stability, resource munificence, um, and that all influence 
in this model, basically as a moderator, the network effectiveness, and you can measure that on different levels and different ways, um, and people have uh, done that. Um, so this looks like that um, the field has actually made some progress, and I would admit that is the case. However, um, one of the problems we also have in, uh, in the research on uh, whole networks, management of networks, is that usually we have one study, and then whatever the outcome is accepted as the truth, and then basically somebody else does something else at a different angle or a different corner with different theoretical concepts, different methods, um, and then we have some new insights, but sort of the, the build-up um, is relatively slow um, and uh, fragmented. Um, another um, sort of major advance, I think, was recently uh, presented by Proven and Canis, where they basically looked at the literature in business, but also public management, and they came up with three different ideal types. Um, they call them modes of network governance. Uh, and their argument basically is um, since the discussion on governance forms in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, so basically Williamson and Powell, um, we very often compared hierarchy networks and the markets with each other, but networks were treated as if they were more or less all the same. Uh, and they make the claim that networks can, be, can look quite differently and can also um, be governed quite uh, differently. And they argue that uh, you c there are basically three ideal types, one that they call self or participant governed, um, which basically uh, can be effective if it's relatively small, if trust between participants is high, if the, um, the need for network level competency, uh, competencies is relatively low, um, and goal consensus is also high. Uh, so participants agree, it's small, and then you can also achieve effective outcomes. Now then there's a lead organization, um, which actually comes from very appropriate Toyota. This is the Toyota room. Um, so uh, a model, a production model if you want, where you have one organization in charge um, and the others are sort of grouped around it. Um, and they claim here you can have moderate trust um, and uh, um, a moderate goal consensus because the lead organization basically de determines the path of the network. Now one of the problems of course is that at some point maybe the lead organization becomes too powerful and the internal legitimacy um, suffers. Um, but what is really I think important from their standpoint is that they say we can have um, uh, hierarchical elements within networks that help us to govern them. Uh? And that you, can, that you can have networks where trust doesn't need to be uh, necessarily very high in order for them to function and to um, uh, be coordinated well, um, because we can have um, forms that um, can deal with that. And then the third model is the network administrative organization, which basically is a model where um, the need for network competencies is very high, um, where you have, uh, where you need to have an an independent organization that controls um, the, the participating organization, organizations and therefore you also need, uh, you don't have to have a, a high level of trust. Um, and uh, the advantage of these two forms is that there is a, um, basically a face to the network. You know, one of the problems networks often face is that who is actually responsible you know, for outside, outside funding agencies, for example, and you have, if you have either a lead organization or an NAO, then there is a face um, to the network which enhances external legitimacy. Hey, Juan, I'm, I'm not familiar with yeah. the literature, yeah. you, so I'm going to ask an yeah. interesting question. Yeah, of course. The network administrative organization, what's an example? I mean, Toyota, I know we're in the Toyota world. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, an example would be, um, for example, if you would, uh, that comes more from the business world, if you would uh, uh, create a joint venture and you would set up this joint venture as a, a separate um, organization, 
but you would still have input from all the from all the other out of the network purpose yeah it is created purely out of the network purpose yeah, yeah? Um, and the mental health network in Arizona is the most <laughs> sorry the mental health network uh, yeah in Arizona so uh, so the idea is here that you have an, an, an a coordinating controlling organizations that does not have sort of individual stakes in the network but rather uh, has a network focus um, as its mission um, that's the that's the idea okay so um, as I said um, there is I think considerable progress but I still think um, we can make more progress in really sort of accumulating knowledge by trying to replicating uh, some of the studies and then um, uh, basically extending uh, the theory that they have uh, uh, developed um, and um, I chose um, for Proven and Millward not only because Arizona is nice um, and it's nice to be there but uh, it's actually the seminal study in the field. Uh, the last time I checked, uh, it's uh, by now 270 citations in uh, the Web of Science and 640 in Google Scholars. So it's not only the seminal study on the effectiveness of networks, but in the field of interorganizational networks um, in general. So, um, and I think it, it, it is um, a study which has advanced the the field and the, the ideas of how we can look at um, these uh, kind of networks considerable. Um, but also with this study, of course, um, it is limited, like every study. Yeah? In that case, um, it's four cases uh, with a specific size uh, in the US in a particular field, namely mental health. Yeah? And it is a particular kind of network um, in the terminology of Proven and Millward a service implementation network. Uh, you can have other types of network, information diffusion network, problem solving networks, or community capacity building networks. And their effectiveness might work in a very different uh, way. So by re replicating um, this study in a first step, we would like to first enhance external validity. So by um, looking at similar networks in the Netherlands, um, we try to see whether the theoretical um, framework they built holds also um, with cases in the Netherlands and uh, with uh, networks that have a different size. Um, the networks in, um, in Proven and Millward's case were between 30 and 35 organizations and in the Netherlands they were smaller, uh, between 9 and 16 organizations. And then in a second step, um, we joined the data from the first four networks and from the second four networks in the Netherlands um, and tried to analyze that with uh, a configurational approach, QCA. Um, and um, I think the great advantage is that um, a configurational approach provides uh, the possibility to look at outcomes um, from, for example, the idea of conjunction which means that um, very often we, we might find cases where one factor will not do anything to effectiveness. Yeah? So, for example, stability, as Proven and Millward actually argued uh, in, their, um, in their original paper, stability alone will not lead to effectiveness only in conjunction with other factors. Uh, and it would be interesting to see what the other factors is and what that actually does. So if you have stability and resource munificence, does that do anything um, uh, to enhance effectiveness? Then um, we have equifinality, which means that um, multiple ways can lead to Rome, so to speak. So um, given certain constraints, for example, a network manager might be under, uh, what are their options? Um, for example, might it be that um, stability and centralized integration might lead to effectiveness, but also resource munificence and external control. Yeah? So the idea is that you, that you develop an idea that multiple combinations of factors might be effective under certain circumstances. And then another idea is uh, asymmetry, and that is that um, 
a certain configuration of factors might lead to effective outcomes, but there might be different configurations that lead to ineffective outcomes. Yeah, in, in a linear regression, that's basically just a mirror image. Now you get the minuses in front of the, the um, uh, coefficients and that's it. But in terms of configurational thinking, it could also be interesting to see what factors actually lead to ineffectiveness uh, in order to avoid that and say, well, to have effective networks is maybe too much to ask, but we can at least try to avoid um, ineffective networks and we want to know the factors that lead to ineffectiveness. So going back um, to the original framework uh, Proven and Mill were developed, um, they still drew this up as a linear model even though their propositions are already formulated in a configurational way. For example, they talk about stability as a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition. Um, and they say resource munificence, um, for example, or low resource munificence will lead to low to medium effectiveness. Um, and um, and uh, high resource munificence will lead to medium to high effectiveness which basically you could reformulate it that it's a necessary but not a sufficient um, condition. Now, they argue that um, in order for networks to be effective, you need centralized integration. Um, and that was actually a disappointment for them. Bryn Milward told me once because they thought, well, from a democratic perspective, it's highly integrated. Everybody cooperates with each other. Um, this is sort of what also the sponsoring agency apparently had in mind. Um, but that's not what sort of the, the data said. The data said that um, actually if you are centralized in, centrally integrated, meaning the coordination integration is basically done by a lead organization in Proven and Keynes term, um, then you're more effective. And the reason for that is that it's enhanced um, coordination. And then they argue that direct non-fragmented external control uh, increases effectiveness. Um, and the reason for that is that if you have multiple controlling agencies and funding agencies, that basically sort of splinters um, the control. And it's actually better that if you have one financing and one control for the, for the whole network. And then I already talked about system stability and high resource munificence that's also relatively, um, I think, logical. Okay, so um, how did we operationalize it? Since we started with the Proven and Millward study and we wanted to replicate it as closely as possible, we followed the same operationalization as they did. Uh, network integration is basically a combination of density, centralization, and influence uh, concentration. So influence concentration is um, um, they asked and we did all the participating organizations um, which of the other organizations they usually take into account when they make decisions. And then you basically get scores for every organization and highly centralized is if the second ranked organization has 50% or less of the score of the first um, then external control, um, the more, the, the higher the number of external funders, the higher, the more fragmented it is. And then the more uh, institutions between the actual uh, work floor, so to speak, and the funding source, um, the more indirect uh, the funding is. And as I said, the idea is that the more indirect and the more fragmented the control, the less effective uh, networks will be. System stability is the extent to which organizations enter or exit or in which system changes happen in recent history. Um, their case where most of that idea also came from was Tucson. You basically had a more or less internal revolt uh, recently with organizations where the whole, whole system was um, undergone an upheaval um, and a sort of a really system transformation uh, took place. Resource munificence was per capita spending for mental health care and network effectiveness, uh, mean factor scores, quality of life of a network. 
Um, and Proven and Millward measured that um, for the family members, for the um, mentally ill persons themselves, and for the case managers. Um, we didn't have that much resources, so we looked at the case manager's uh, assessment and the patient's assessment. So we didn't go to the family. There were also reasons of confidentiality um, because once you need to talk to family members, you also have to know who these people actually are. So that's um, a little bit of a, of a restriction. So um, in the second step, then, we had eight networks. So we took the data from the original study in the US. So we didn't go back and run the whole study in the US again, but took the original data, but uh, collected original data from four networks in the Netherlands. Replication, of course, in the social sciences is very hard. Now, Nicole and I, we talked about this uh, this afternoon. Um, in psychology, you have the, the, the possibility to run experiments and you can very, come very close to uh, the original setting, um, but in sort of non-controlled um, social science research, it's very hard. So we try to get as closely as possible, uh, but in the replication literature, this is known as good enough replication. Um, so I don't claim we, had, we managed to really do one to one, but we try to get really as close as possible. Um, for example, in choosing the networks, so we chose networks um, who were set up to care for non-institutionalized adults um, uh, with um, mental illness above 18 years. And as I said, the size of the networks varied um, between our cases in the Netherlands and the original cases in the US. Um, we used the same um, types of ties, so uh, service delivery, referrals between the different um, providers, referrals received, referrals sent, case coordination, joint programs, and service contracts. We also used a random sample for patients uh, and used a questionnaire quality of life um, and um, had uh, responses between 32 and 67. Um, per network. Um, so the, the, the difficult thing in these kind of network, in these kind of studies is that you basically have to have two waves of data collection. Now you have a, a wave of data collection with the organizations, um, about the organizational structure, about the network, and then you have to collect the outcome um, data. Um, and um, I would freely admit that that was a problem, I think, in the original study and also with us that, um, of course, this population um, uh, has its problems. Um, for example, um, we randomly sampled the, the patients, but then we had to give the questionnaires to the case managers and they would uh, give the uh, forms to the patients and then collect them again. So that sort of not really a, a control, I would freely admit that. Um, but um, yeah, that's um, in order to replicate that study, we had to, to yeah, just go along with that. And then um, we did a comparative analysis of all networks with FASI set um, QCA as developed by Regan. Now the, the idea of, of uh, FASI set, uh, and I think this is, um, really a, um, uh, a great development since the beginnings almost 25 years ago is that um, Charles Reagan and, and uh, colleagues have now developed a set of tools where you can um, uh, qualify and calibrate um, all sorts of data from binary data, CRISP set where you have um, basically zero one for example, stable, non-stable, uh, to a continuous fuzzy set where you can calibrate um, interval data, for example, per capita um, spending uh, in dollars or euros. And then in between different um, uh, fuzzy values, either a three value, five value, or a seven value, which sort of provides 
uh, according to the data you have possibilities for, for fine-grained um, analysis. And it's also possible to combine different um, fuzzy sets um, in, in a joint analysis. Okay, so um, one of the issues, of course, and um, I'm very open about this, I really would like to have your feedback, um, is to how is it possible to combine these two projects? Yeah. Um, so the four networks in the US and the four networks in the Netherlands. And um, these are, this is the outcome score, these are the factor scores. And um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, Proven and Millward in 95 already sort of qualified them um, from um, uh, low to moderate to high, sort of which are either three or five value fuzzy sets. Yeah, so we basically took their qualification and also applied it to the factor scores in the Netherlands. And in this, um, in this uh, overview, you see basically a five value fuzzy set. This is the range um, of factor scores for the outcome, the mean factor scores. And then we basically qualified them as uh, below minus 0.18 as low to higher than um, 18 as, uh, as high, which um, it gets you to a certain degree of membership, yeah? which basically would say Providence, which also in the original case was the most effective network, um, has a membership of one, so full, fully effective. And um, the other networks, one in, the, in Tucson and one of the Dutch networks um, has a zero membership, so the least um, effective. And then um, we went through all the variables and also um, could build on Proven and Millward's original study uh, in terms of uh, concentration of influence, whether they are dispersed or concentrated. Um, then um, we could also use, and that's I think is also an advantage of, of uh, a configurational analysis, um, basically the function um, and um, to come up with uh, joint concepts. So in their, um, in their original study, they talk about centralized integration and they basically say, well, there's density and there's centralization. But with uh, QCA, you can basically join this and you can come up with a qualification of um, density and centralization. Yeah? So what is the, what is the membership um, and to what extent is that actually, um, can that be uh, combined and is that then beneficial? Yeah? So in that case, we have, for example, Delta had a, has a high density, so membership of one, but also a high centralization which would the combined value be also one. And uh, this sign, the little um, snake there, is uh, the negation. So that would just be the complementary score. Then uh, external control, um, also the same idea. Um, they have basically two concepts in there, um, uh, direct, indirect, and fragmented, non-fragmented. So with uh, QCA, you can also combine that in direct and uh, non-fragmented, you know, which I think is a really nice feature. Um, then we uh, calculated the capital um, per capita healthcare spending, and the Netherlands being a European welfare state, you see immediately the big differences. Um, we um, controlled for uh, purchasing power parity for inflation, and really try to sort of uh, balance this out so to make it equivalent to uh, the early 90s spending um, in the US, but still there's a big, um, big difference. But you can see if you have, if you put these eight cases together and you calibrate them, then um, in terms of the diversity, Providence would get also a one as being resource um, rich. Yeah? Um, and, uh, and Tucson, being a uh, um, relatively scarce resource environment. Um, system stability, um, also that's a sort of a, 
uh, um, a crisp set, so either unstable or stable. And this is sort of the, the overview. The, the US case is in blue, the Dutch case is in orange. Um, and I think what that table shows is that, um, at least for me, it would be impossible to see sort of whether there is any configuration that we can draw out. And uh, I mean, I think about QCA as a further development of qualitative comparative case studies. You know? So I don't see it really as a, as a, as a method that should now replace um, linear regression or, or other standard uh, statistical techniques, but rather help us to have a technique in between to go back and forth between sort of um, a general um, overview and back to the single cases yeah? um, and have the possibility to more systematically um, come up with um, theoretical insights that we might be able to do sort of doing a handish uh, comparison um, of cases. What you see in terms of network effectiveness is that Providence in the sort of comparison is still the most effective uh, one here and then, but also not all the Dutch networks are effective, um, which is nice um, in terms of uh, having some variation. <laughs> yeah, I know. In the, in the heart of a researcher, that's a... Now we can all guess what city Bravo is. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the, the intermediate solution QCA provided. So uh, in QCA, you can um, basically look at the, the um, truth table with all the different cases. And then QCA will provide a complex solution, which very often has no reduction in complexity. So it will basically just give you back the variables um, all variables uh, combined in very long uh, solutions, and that's of course not really an advantage. Then QCA will give you a very parsimonious uh, solution, very often with one or two, but most of the time, uh, basically, the empirical um, relation to this very uh, parsimonious solution is, is very low. And then there is sort of an intermediate solution, um, and this is what this represents. Um, this is um, the dots are ends, so joint um, presents, and the pluses um, is our ors, um, so read or. So what this basically says is that there are two paths to effectiveness if we analyze the eight cases uh, jointly, and that is um, we need influence concentration and stability and resource munificence and either integration through cohesive ties or all of the above and centralization and external control. So there are basically two, two paths that um, uh, we found will lead to um, effective uh, networks. Um, and um, this, so this solution basically, um, and sorry, I have to say that these are sufficient solutions. So both paths are, are sufficient solutions. And this basically um, confirms um, to a large part the results uh, Proven Millward also had, um, but refines them. Um, what is interesting is that um, we, f we found, for example, stability to be nearly a necessary condition. Yeah? Um, but not sufficient. Yeah, so we need other, we need other uh, factors. We also found here what they claim is that um, integration basically um, can happen either through cohesive ties or through centralization, but not together. Now that if you join them, then this would actually have detrimental um, effects. And um, what is interesting here is that that external control only comes up as uh, a condition 
with centralization. Yeah, so um, that's I think is an interesting puzzle um, that we looked at. Um, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So um, we have different possible configurations of conditions, um, as I just laid out. Um, and if we go back to the cases, uh, if we look at these two paths and look, go back to the cases, we can see that um, this path basically refers to the smaller networks, and this path uh, refers to the larger networks. So size seems to be uh, an, uh, a crucial factor here, which is um, sort of in line with what uh, Proven and Keynes um, said. So we think basically what we have to deal with is for larger networks, it's the lead organization uh, that with a centralized structure will lead to effective outcomes. And for smaller networks, it's the self-governed or participant-governed um, uh, network that, under certain circumstances, uh, meaning um, munificence and stability and influence concentration, will lead to uh, effective outcomes, which were formulated in two propositions. Um, so you need, um, depending on the size, um, and you could um, say, for further research, look at other conditions, of course. But here we come up with the idea that size basically will or can determine um, the governance mode and the structure and the context uh, will lead to, to effective um, outcomes. So um, I, I still think, and I hope I could convince you um, a bit at least, of the merits of trying to, to replicate prior studies in a different concept, uh, context and then build on this um, to um, accumulate knowledge and refine uh, theory. I think um, uh, FASI said QCA has a potential here for integration of, uh, uh, of cases across studies. Uh, that of course is also dependent on either the willingness of colleagues to um, hand over their data uh, their questionnaires or of journals demanding, and you can see that in other fields that increasingly that is demanded um, to basically make the data publicly available at least after some time uh, that the researchers have to um, get their own publications out of it, but then it could be used. And I think for the public management field that could also be interesting. Um, and I think um, the, there's an, really a an, an developing um, uh, field now um, or a developing method with QCA in the study of organizations and networks. I think it's especially suitable for studies where you have some sort of outcomes yeah, that you want to explain with certain configurations of factors uh, that can uh, create these outcomes. And Per Fis, uh, who is just a couple of buildings further here, uh, will have a, um, which you probably know if you took his class, um, paper in Academy of Management Journal uh, this year um, that I think describes it and uses that uh, uh, quite well. I also think um, for public management researchers who are interested um, and devoted to um, make an impact also in, uh, on praxis, um, I think this provides a, a great opportunity to come up with research with insights that also are well applicable to for practitioners. Yeah, so if you can tell them, a network manager for example, well there are two paths that we have found so far that, that will likely be to lead to effective uh, outcomes, then there's something they can manage yeah, um, and, uh, and apply. There, <clears throat> there are, of course, also limitations. Um, the fuzzy set scores and the qualification of cases is, is uh, open to discussion. Yeah? And that, of course, um, becomes more difficult um, the 
the more restrictive you are, you know, if you use a crisp set, so a zero or one dichotomy, then the question, of course, it makes a big difference whether you qualify a case to be zero or one, or stable or unstable. Uh, it's, uh, it's better if you have a seven uh, value fuzzy set you know, than if you are 0 0.25 or 0 0.5, the difference is not that big. Huh? Um, that's, I think that is still uh, an, an issue. Then uh, also in this case, we, we assume causality, but we don't really test it, um, uh, which is also not really the idea of QCA. It's more really a theory development tool. Um, eight cases, I mean, I talked to uh, sort of the QCA uh, experts and they say eight cases is sort of um, at the lower end. So um, um, I think it is still a valid approach, but if we had more cases, it would be better. Now we have four or five factors in eight cases. So also for QCA, that's um, um, sort of at the limits. Um, then, as I said, measuring quality of life as indicator of effectiveness has inherent problems, uh, of course, and uh, I would like to really to do this kind of research um, also on networks where we have um, sort of more reliable outcome data, uh, where we can control that better. Um, and um, this is a, a type of network, as I said, service implementation network and information diffusion networks and, and uh, community capacity building or whatever typology you want to use, um, other types of networks might function differently. Uh, so uh, it would be interesting to, to look at these other types of network as well. But it's, despite these limitations, um, I think um, this is a, a promising um, avenue uh, to take. Um, and um, I hope you have lots of questions. Uh, thanks for your attention. selection mechanism so that they try to um, possibly weed out the most difficult cases or, set, or, or move them on to others? Well, there, there are two aspects. There's that aspect sort of strategic behavior, and then there's, of course, a data collection aspect. Now, the data collection aspect is that even though these people are not hospitalized, the, the people who fill out the questionnaire are probably the ones that are doing better. Yeah? But since I at least would assume that this is universal. Um, I don't think that there's that much bias, but I would say this is definitely a limitation and we might miss sort of the population that um, is not that well yeah, and that maybe there are different mechanisms in place in these systems to treat people that are at the better end anyhow. Yeah. Uh, I would freely admit that and that is, that is what I said, that's really the data collection problem. Now, the other problem is the strategic problem. Yeah? Um, I have to say, um, in the original study, they don't talk about it. And from the Netherlands, I would assume um, that's not that much the case. Yeah? Since basically, in, a, in, in the European welfare state, um, that doesn't really matter to them. Um, I mean, they're not evaluated um, or I mean, they get their money for, for their cases. And uh, so I think that's not, not an issue that much to basically single out um, people that maybe cost a lot, um, but ruin your effectiveness statistics. Yeah? So, um, um, but that's a good question. I actually have to ask that, uh, Brendan and Keith, to what extent they think that that might have been the case uh, in their studies. Um, I'll actually want to write that down. Um.
So part of the, the, the reviewers say things like, um, well, do we know that mental health is not demographically or geographically in different parts of the city or the area? So we have more worse mental health in, in cities than we do necessarily in the suburbs, yeah. which could be a problem. The other thing is whether or not I have worse clients may make me want to organize differently. I may want to be more centralized, or I may want to be shared more because I might want to just push them off to my partners. And so now we have kind of a shared mechanism where everyone just kind of tries to play hot potato with everyone with their patients. Mm -hmm. So we just, you know, I think that you have the variation on um, effectiveness, and then you have variation, I guess, in, in both directions of governance. So the thing is, if you, if you had everything centralized equals effectiveness, I'd be a little bit worried that the causation wasn't the other way around. Meaning? Meaning that um, you, mental health places that have really healthy patients just mm -hmm. organize in a, in a centralized way. Oh, okay. It's just easier for them to do it. Yeah, they don't okay. have to worry about... Okay. Do you have a homogenous population situation so you can standardize? Is that what you mean? Yeah, or you know, they, they don't have to watch the patient so closely and be in such mm -hmm. contact because the patient that Jan and I share is about to kill themselves, so we need to be in contact. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Okay. You yeah. up on both sides of the question. <laughs> it's like, well, if you have the really tough ones, maybe you want to be really just decentralized right. so yeah. you can pass them around, or maybe you want to be really centralized because well, you're going to have to have a very tight, oh, tight communication system. Yeah. So luckily, he has them disparate. He has a, it both ways. Right. If you have it just one way, you can make up a story okay. either way. Maybe that relates to a question or, or sort of a suggestion. Since you say there are two parameters, right? one is the, uh, the more centralized, the providence is the example. Yeah. So I'm on the eight, which is an example of the other one. Then if you look at one real yeah. case, then you might have some way of looking at yeah. what Nicole is asking. Even though it's probably difficult. Um, I mean, we, can go, we could go back to the Dutch networks mm -hmm. and basically try to more informally try to tease out whether these kind of mechanisms that you both talked about are at play although people might not readily be, you know, um, at least not the case managers, readily uh, be uh, uh, willing to admit that. Um, mm -hmm. You would probably actually have to talk to the families. I mean, they probably would, would report that, uh, whether they have the feeling, you know, that, that their fathers, mothers, or whatever, are sort of moved from one uh, organization to the other, like hot potatoes. Um, uh, but that's, that's a good point. I mean, we, we at least have to also include that in the limitations. I mean, that's, I think, uh, is, a, is. So that, that would mean um, um, sort of not only the, the specificity of, um, of the type of network, but also the specificity of the type of patients yeah. Uh, yeah. Might, might make a difference how to, how to organize. I mean, that relates to my question about in terms of how do you, how to incorporate some of these demographic variables into QCA that might not, you know, in terms of the framework of membership or not membership. But I mean, each of these cities have characteristics that potentially influence the networks in some way that might be happening at the same time. As, yeah. And so. Well, drugs and poverty probably are two big parts of it. <laughs> yeah. But even in terms of like a like I don't like a fixed effect. I mean, you have two different countries, and yeah. so I don't. I guess that would make sense. You could do a membership, you know, whether it's <laughs> a member of the U.S. or not. But it seems like you know, obviously, when you're dealing with two countries and two different uh, societies, that there may be paths that work. I mean, with that number of cases, it's hard to show, but there may be paths that work in one. Yeah. You know, national I mean, here, of course, you run into the same problem as always. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of variables, and I'd really admit that it might also, um, you know, um, play a role. But uh, but have you ever added in just you know one of your your strict sets being U.S. versus the Netherlands, and see because oh, well, it would actually be a good result if it if it if it not become a condition when you when you did the PCA. Yeah, 
even though from you know from the effectiveness i mean we we see that i mean we have sort of two cases that are not effective two cases that are in the middle so i it's not like at least from the effectiveness outcomes i would suggest that there's a clear us uh, netherlands right, but the divide but the configurations might be yeah that I was expecting you to tell us something about the difference of, of uh, resources and outcomes. And you showed quite a significant disparity among the U.S. cases, Tucson being the least uh, in terms of resource <coughs> commitment, and the Netherlands being, I guess what you're telling us is that they're, they're standardized? Yeah. So, so that if you only looked at Netherlands, you'd say resources doesn't explain much about effectiveness. Um, no, I wouldn't say that. But holding, you're holding resources constant. No, I would say what, what, it, what it shows is, is what Proven and Millward also said in the beginning. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition. And I would, I would conclude here that um, you know, after a certain level, it, it doesn't really matter that much anymore. You know, then other factors really become more important. That would be my interpretation. Well, how would you then interpret the United States case? Sorry? How then interpret the, the United States case where there was significant differences in resources? Let's, um, here. Yeah. Uh, from from, from uh, basically yeah, 19 here. to 52,000? 52 dollars. Dollars. Per, right? per, per capita, capita, yeah. Capita, yeah, thousand, yeah. Per, per capita. Yeah, I mean, I would, I, would say, I would argue that, I mean, resource munificence alone and that was also the argument in the original study, basically doesn't guarantee you um, being effective. <coughs> no? um, but if you, if you don't have resources, yeah, that's what I said with asymmetry. Now that would be, would be, uh, um, and I, uh, no, it actually I'm did not come. But you're you're yeah. telling us that, that uh, each one of the, 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 the communities in the Netherlands has eight times the resources per capita as Tucson. Yeah. How could they be in the same game in terms of providing services? Unless well, money doesn't matter. The, the beauty of CQCA is to show that you know funding is not so. Only if you look at other configuration, then you can't use that as the main explanatory. I'm not trying to the main one. I'm just saying that there ought to be significant performance differences with the resources inputs. That doesn't come out of the results. It does not come out of the results. Yeah, and and I think that's. But you know, and yeah, but that's because w w the, the, the Netherlands, on average, doesn't outperform the United States on, the, on, on their measure of network effectiveness. You say they do not? They do not. They both, they both have exactly the same level of effectiveness on average. Yeah. <laughs> but why is Providence pegged at the full membership also? That's, um, yeah, that's because if you basically recalibrate that in the full range, yeah. you know, then, then the, the basically the full membership is somewhere probably at 50 or something and then you already fall into the full membership yeah, yeah so that's that's basically the the, the fuzzy set huh? calibration yeah. right. and that's that seems that that may be that, I mean that and that's of course you know if we had let's say uh, three hundred dollars now then then the the, the basically uh, membership would be somewhere um, somewhere here, but yeah, maybe that's a thing we have to look into um, and see. Um, you know, if but I, I still think basically the 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 reason why we did that, and that is maybe um, necessary to understand that. I mean, QCA basically is a case-based approach. Yeah, so even though. We, we somehow uh, compare what you do in the second step, you basically compare within a case yeah, and try to find that. And, and uh, I mean, Provident and Millward, they originally um, described Providence also as being in a resource rich environment. Yeah? So that's why this is also coded as being resource rich. Uh, that's um, Providence. But they're yeah? in the United States. Uh, and they are in the United States, yeah. So given that, that the system was stable and resource rich, you know, we tried to find that configuration um, for basically for that case also. Yeah. And then, um, but I, I think it, I'm, I'm sort of admit it looks a little bit strange 
You know, if you say, well, this is eight times more as Tucson, you know, uh, there must be a, a difference. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't say there must be, but I was expecting one. <laughs> why, why, why? So the difference of the y is still number y is still greater one for poverty in terms of absolute amount of money. Is it? I, I don't fully really understand why probably still That's because the if you look here from 19 to 185 uh -huh. um, then the um, let's say 20 that's um, the uh, bum, bum, bum. Let me see. Maybe. Oh, that's compared with yeah, the other basically thirty two out of one sixty. Yeah. Right? No, but what you would do is if that is if that is a hundred percent, then fifty percent oh, is is uh, below or above the yeah. medium or whatever. Yeah, so the um I I don't I have to admit I don't quite remember the calibration, but from the from the uh from the fa from the numbers here as I can say that basically the the crossover well um, point uh, would be probably somewhere in the in the 30s. Um, so this is 13 percent now, 84. Yeah, I mean, what what that tells me is that um, I mean we basically did it relatively mechanically, yeah, and uh, and. Uh, that we maybe have to go back and with the sort of the more the qualitative uh, and also do it sort of maybe not the, the really fuzzy set, but uh, but bring in more qualitative information and uh, and qualify the, the the systems in terms of resource munificence maybe with a five set um, or a three set even. Mm -hmm. yeah. would, it, would, it not, would it go against QCA to make the 185 the, the full 100? And then take a percentage of that. So yeah, but then, but then basically, the providence would come. Providence would come as as sort of very low resource munificence, mm -hmm. which really sort of contradicts the qualification in the original study. Right, but as long, but if you put in the the thick the, the national context, it potentially would. Yeah, true. Would yeah. Oh. Is it, is it that, because I know nothing about this QCA, is it that... You wrote it in a set grant with it in it, so you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> what I, I honestly know nothing about. I mean, is it that, in my mind, this is what I think, is that the QCA is kind of this, this thing and, and, we're, and doing it the way that David is saying or is kind of trying to make it linear when it's not necessarily linear in the cases? Um... I mean, rather than having those spending as sets, yeah. we're trying to force it to be linear yeah. by saying that, can't we just adjust this and adjust this so it's a really nice distribution? We're forcing and a variable to be linear, but not the effects to be right. linear. Which QCA, its big problem, though, is, is with the idea that each variable is competing against each other for biggest effect. Yeah. But the, within the variable, it's not. It can be linear, or it could be continuous. I don't know. I mean, it seems like it doesn't go. It might not go against the whole philosophy, or it may. I don't know. That's I don't know. But I, I would imagine, with a case of eight, trying to make the data linear is probably not statistically valid. Well, that's, this is not a probabilistic model. This is a logic model. So, so that you're, 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 you're looking for, for, for sets of dependent variables that all occur at the same time for a success. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's really what, um, uh, what Reagan's model is doing. So thinking about it statistically is, is, is but just think about what are necessary conditions and what are sufficient conditions, and what, is a, and what is a complete statement of the necessary and sufficient conditions that distinguish between the, the, the successes and the failures. That's really what that, the, the, this uh, technique is trying to do. I, I, I must say that, um, uh, I love that you used it. I read, I read one of his books like literally 15 or 16 years ago. It was the first time that I've used, uh, uh, I've seen someone use it, and I've always thought it was um, a very good way to look at um, a cross case comparison. So you validated the fact that I spent a day reading this book. 15 years ago. <laughs>
Shall we eat or I have, I have another sure. question? No, 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 I just yeah, have one more question. It's unrelated. I want to give this not my field either, but it was one of your conclusions you drew, and you know, just something popped in the head, which happens. You say something. That's good. That's why we're else. here. <laughs> so, so you said that when you actually took a look at the data, that you, you mentioned your, uh, for when there are a large N, lead organizations seem to lead to be the most effective. And when, when they're small and self-governing seems to be the most effective. And I thought of Mansur Olson, the logic of collective action, which is what he said a long time ago about collective action, which is when you have a small end, people can come together because of social ties, communications are low, uh, personal networks are there. And by the way, enforcement is there because I'm watching. We, we have close offices that I know when she's in. Uh, yeah, and she knows what I'm into, and I know, we all know who's taking the jelly belts. We, we, because we're small. But if, you know, we don't know a thousand. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And yeah. so hierarchy may be a function of size, which is what Matt Wilson said. But, you know, one thing about it is you have to go back to the nature of the goods being produced. And yeah. actually going back to Nicole's observation is the types of patients you're dealing with yeah. that would also yeah. affect the I would think so. Dynamic. But yeah. he, he, it was your general conclusion, though. You yeah. Just brought into the, yeah. You just said two general propositions. No, I've read it long ago in grad school, and but that's a good reminder too, to mm -hmm. basically include that. Um, I mean, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, um, and that's definitely... I don't know. Like it just goes with your conclusion. No. I'm not yeah. sure it's thorough enough to what you're finding. No, I think so. Thanks. Okay. Good. Thank you. So Thanks. Thank you.